Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our attendees joining us today for this latest Data Science Central webinar. This is Bill Voorhees, your host. I'm the Editorial Director with Data Science Central and also Chief Data Scientist for Data Magnum. I'd like to start off our event today by thanking Pivotal for sponsoring today's event. Pivotal is a longtime supporter of the Data Science Central community, and we're honored to have them sponsoring our event today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including Tableau, Microsoft, Hortonworks, Oracle, IBM, and Teradata, to name just a few. These past webinars are available on demand at datasciencecentral.com, and if you haven't had the opportunity to view them, I encourage you to take a look. They provide some very useful insight into a wide variety of topics of current interest to our data science community. Today's webinar is entitled, The Past, Present, and Future of Data Science, a Live Roundtable. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format of today's webinar. Uh, today's event will be about one hour long. Uh, we have three panelists that I'll introduce in just a minute. Today's event is open format, live discussion, roundtable. And this event is being recorded and will be available on datasciencecentral.com in the next few days following today's live event. So as this event is different from our standard educational webinars, I'd also like to encourage our attendees to provide questions throughout today's live discussion. This is a unique opportunity for those attending today's event to participate fully and engage directly with our esteemed panel. So I'm very pleased to introduce today's speakers, Sarah Erni, Wu Jung, and Rushmi Ragu with Pivotal. Sarah is a principal data scientist at Pivotal, leading the San Francisco practice. She executes projects with customers from pharmaceutical companies and healthcare providers to financial institutions. Before Pivotal, Sarah obtained her PhD from Stanford in biomedical informatics, performing research at the interface of biomedicine and machine learning. She also co-founded a company offering expert services in informatics to both academia and industry. Wu is also a principal data scientist at Pivotal, with a background in industrial applications of both humble and advanced inferential statistics. He's focused on delivering a wide range of data science projects. He's also passionate about the adoption of R and other advanced analytic tools in the big and fast data ecosystem. Prior to Pivotal, he was a senior statistician at a Bay Area startup, M-Factor, now part of IBM. Uh, where he built and delivered demand analysis solutions powered by Bayesian hierarchical models. He holds a Master of Science in Statistics from Stanford and a Bachelor of Science from Cornell. Rushmi is a principal data scientist at Pivotal as well, with a focus on the Internet of Things and applications in the energy sector. Her work has spanned diverse industry problems, including uncovering patterns and anomalies in massive data sets to, pre to predictive maintenance. She holds a PhD in mechanical engineering with a minor in management science and engineering from Stanford. Her doctoral work focused on the development of novel computational models of the cardiovascular system to aid in disease research. And prior to that, she obtained a master's and bachelor's degree in engineering science from the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Well, thanks for all for being with us today. I'm looking forward to moderating today's discussion. So as I mentioned a moment ago, Today's Data Science Central webinar will be a live roundtable discussion with the introduced members of the Pivotal Data Science team. This is a truly unique event that is intended to provide DSC community members a full hour to interact with and learn from uh, their years of real world experience. Uh, you, the audience, are again encouraged to participate and take advantage of this unique access and knowledge, with, knowledge base provided here today. So be sure and Enter your questions right away in the QA box on your screen. So today's uh, discussion will focus around some of these questions, not limited to these, but we're going to try and cover at least how did you become a data scientist, what steps did you take, uh, what are the most important qualities of a data scientist, how would you describe a typical workday, what's the largest data set you've worked on, what tools or platforms do you use, R, Python, Hadoop, or so forth? 
Uh, how do you think the field of data science will evolve in the years to come? What tools and techniques are you looking forward to using in the future? And in what ways do you think data science will continue to transform these industries? And once again, these are just our suggested questions. So audience, please be sure and send in the questions that you're interested in discussing with this interesting panel. So let's get started. We're going to start with uh, some get to know you questions. Um, and let's start with just a discussion of, well, how did you become a data scientist? And, and I'd be interested to know also if there was a particular aha moment uh, when you knew that data science was going to be your future career. So let's start with Sarah. Great. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so I, I don't think there was an aha moment for when I wanted to become a data scientist. I think there was an aha moment for when I realized what I was doing was data science in reality. And I would probably assume that that's the case for many people in this field by now. Um, I, I often joke that the way that I got into data science was with tennis, because when I was in high school, I had to take a class in computer science. Um, it was the only one that was offered for an elective at the time that didn't interfere with my other tennis-related activities. And that was my first chance to kind of touch upon that field in general. Um, but I was always passionate about biology, and in college I was able to, in, in my first year, enter a new major that just came into existence, bioinformatics. And that, in essence, is the concept of taking machines and discovering patterns inside of the biological domain. So I really started off focusing on genomic space, meaning looking at DNA and mutations in cancer, and then moved forward into grad school to actually work on image-based analyses, so looking at images and trying to understand what it was that we were looking at and using computers to kind of solve for what it is that you might be doing by hand. So in essence, what that becomes is building models for biologists um, and then, of course, I started a um, consulting company that was meant to bring the concept of informatics to all other groups of biomedicine and then extended beyond that ultimately into things like looking at uh, web logs to try and predict what somebody might be interested in looking at, um, even did a foray into a dating app for matchmaking services. And again, um, in all of these instances, it was this concept of taking data and trying to find something that was predictive. Um, and, and really that's when I, I would say I realized that this concept of data science, which at the time um, was, was just coming to be something kind of big, um, was actually what I was working on. Um, when I started grad school, there was definitely a lot of talk about this wave of bioinformatics that was coming and that they needed to train people up for the wave of bioinformatics. And I was sort of entering at the beginning of it. And of course, when I left grad school in 2012, it was then the wave of data science that I'm entering at the beginning of it. And I think these waves ultimately are this concept of applying machine learning and stats to sciences. And it was really earlier very specific, and we wanted to name each subdomain. And I think now we've moved into the space of allowing that concept of analyzing large data sets to really be generalized to something like data science. So that would be really where I would think um, it, it came from for me. Um, but I'd love to hear, Wu, what, what your perspective is on how you arrived here. Sure. Thanks, thanks, Sarah. Um, so I would have to say that I kind of fell into this um, in one way or another as well. Uh, I think um, I actually still remember my first uh, statistics course that I took in college, and it was um, it was new for me because uh I think at the time like I was um thinking about ways to I guess gather evidence to support a hypothesis or to support a let's say a, an argument and um it's great to get qualitative evidence to support your claims and to make point um but I think what was very interesting about data analysis data science statistics was that uh it was an opportunity to use um, data as evidence um, to um, to test the hypothesis, right? And so uh, that was very very interesting to me, and it it, it just made a lot of sense, right? Um, in terms of you know what's the best way you can actually present um, a specific um, specific point 
or a specific point of view um, and have it be as objective as you could make it, right? Um, and so, yeah, that really kind of got me down the path of, of statistics. And um, I think, like, in that second semester of that course, we started to touch on, like, regression analysis. And um, that was really interesting because um, I actually didn't know, like, anything like that where basically you have, like, this outcome of interest that you wanted to learn more about. And But it wasn't about, like, you know, writing prose or a bunch of, you know, texts and qualitative, um, you know, um, words about, you know, why this point of view is true or why this hypothesis is true or even like beyond, you know, laboratory test results or, or things like that. But it's, it's actually looking at data and then um, putting it into a, a real model, right, that um, basically, you know, relates um, a bunch of input variables, input factors on an outcome of interest. And not only are you able to predict that outcome um, to a reasonable degree, assuming you have good data, um, but you're also able to explain, um, you know, why that outcome is the way it is because of these factors that you've included in this model. And so that was that was very interesting, um, and that was I saw that as something potentially very powerful, and I wanted to learn more about this thing. And so I guess that kind of got me into, you know, getting um, more interested in this field in general, um, you know, applied for a master's program in statistics and really enjoyed that um, that program. And then I guess um, for me, more than kind of the theory uh, and the math and and sort of the um, um, the underlying, I guess, uh, proofs and theorems that kind of go beyond uh, these, these uh, statistical algorithms that we use in data science, I think it was more about the applied portion that really got me interested and the ability to actually, or the opportunities that we have to actually um, test out these hypotheses with, uh, with with real data. And so uh, that got me interested in sort of more industry positions, more than more than academia. Um, and um, and yeah, I mean, I guess uh, did some of that at my first startup um, at M-Factor and then continue doing that here at Greenplum and, and Pivotal. So Raishmi, on to you. Great, thanks. Um, um, thanks for the introduction. And uh, Sarah and Wu definitely have very interesting stories. Um, and uh, just like that, I guess I have a little bit of a windy road. It's not necessarily uh, the straight path into, well, one might think, aha, I, data science is what I want to do. Of course, when both Sarah, uh, all three of us, Sarah Wu and I, were doing our undergraduate degrees, I don't think there was anything labeled uh, data science uh, at the time. Or any programs coming around in that uh, in that way, um, but what I did was I ended up um, being very interested in applied problems of engineering. So I ended up taking a uh, a major in my undergraduate degree, which which brought together advanced mathematics, technology, and computing to solve real world business and industrial problems. And so that really formed the foundation of what um, what even we're doing now. <clears throat> It was very much, um, very much an applied sense. Uh, very much applying all of the hard uh, technical things to the uh, to real world problems. And um, coming out of that, I had a choice of focusing on um, uh, various different fields, and I ended up focusing on the the biomedical or biomechanical side, which is what led me to a PhD in mechanical engineering. So you wouldn't necessarily Many people might not necessarily associate mechanical engineering with the current um, field of data science, but for me, it's a, it was a very logical progression in, in my uh, in my career and my studies, and uh, it was very fascinating to to see that a lot of the mathematical underpinnings, you know, hold if you if you have the underlying rigorous principles set, then you can apply it in many different uh, spaces, be it uh, biomechanics or be it uh, machine learning. <clears throat> so. So from moving, so it got me interested in um, in the application of mechanical principles and mathematical principles to disease research, which is what I did in my PhD, cardiovascular disease research. And um, because you know our bodies are uh, essentially mechanical uh, in nature as well as chemical and biological in nature. So uh, moving on from that towards the end of it, uh, do, during my PhD, I also kept in touch with the the industrial engineering side by doing courses in a minor in management science and engineering and 
um, moving moving from that, it seemed a very logical a logical step. As I was finishing my PhD, this this new emerging um, sort of coalesced field of data science was coming into the view, and it was very much a very logical step for me to come come and uh, work in this field uh, because a lot of the background that I had um, came came together kind of very nicely. Rashmi, thanks very much for that uh, that insight. And, and you know, I share with Wu my own personal uh, aha moment was uh, I think the first time I was exposed to regression uh, and suddenly realized that, boy, a little bit of math and a little bit of code, and I could actually predict the outcome of future events. And to me, that was very exciting, too. You know, uh, we have lots of questions coming in from the audience, and I'd like to encourage uh, the audience to continue to submit those. We're going to try to get to all of them. Let's do one more round of uh, of uh, introductory questions. And, you know, ever since that Fortune article came out that said uh, data science was the sexiest career of the decade, obviously everybody wants to be a data scientist, haha. -ha. Um, but let me ask you all, uh, what do you think are the most important qualities of a data scientist? And Wu, maybe this time we'll start with you. Sure. Um, I think, um, I guess speaking from our you know, the pivotal data science team's experience when we are um, looking for candidates for hire. Um, I guess at the core, uh, we're looking for folks who can, um, you know, write code. And we're also looking for folks who, um, you know, have an understanding of uh, machine learning and statistics uh, to, to some degree. And then thirdly, we also look for great communicators, um, someone who could take these, you know, very complicated, sophisticated mathematical models and be able to explain and um, present, um, you know, this uh, the results to to a non-technical audience. So, you know, to recap again, so code, um, you know, statistics and machine learning, and communication skills are are sort of the three main things that we look for. Um, but uh, but I think Sarah um, uh, has a few things that she'd want to add um, to that as well. I actually just have one thing that it's not necessarily something that can be taught or gained, but it's a question that I think every data scientist probably asks him or herself, which is, am I passionate about data? I think with Rashmi and Wu, it really came through this concept of how amazing, and Bill as well, how amazing it is to take data and allow data to answer questions and allow data to actually speak. And, and provide you with information, not necessarily coming from the perspective of I know something and I want to see it, but can it serve that up? And there is this, on our team, prevalence of a curiosity where you just need to know and need to ask as many questions as possible about that data. We are very sticky with it, spend a lot of time with it. And what might seem boring to other people that are maybe not in that space of data science to look at it to, to plot it, um, to ask a lot of questions, you know, use stats to see whether or not there is a real signal. The excitement that comes out of that is definitely something that it's, it's really easy to spot and know within yourself that this is great and exciting. Um, so, Bill, hopefully that answered the question. Yep, very well, very well. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, the, uh, the viewing audience has started uh, right in with some very pointed questions. And, you know, the very first one they would like you to comment on uh, is a big one in our field, and that is, well, what's the best language for data science, R or Python, or something else? Sure, I, I, can, um, I can kick things off. Um, but, you know, I think this is, at the end of the day, it's mostly about personal preference and what the individual is most comfortable coding in. Because I'm, I, I really, to be very honest, I, I think um, for me, like coding is just a means to an end, um, and the end for me is actually to, you know, to study this data and to build some good models that are representative of, of that data. And so, um, really, I mean, it's just like whatever gets you, um, you know, kind of, you know, the, the most, um, whatever gets you moving the most quickly. And most efficiently with data, I think, is, is probably the right answer. And that's going to differ uh, from individual to individual. Um, I guess very personally, I mean, this is not, uh, again, this is not something to generalize for, for all data scientists. But for, for myself, I mean, it's I picked up R 
it was probably the first programming language that I really kind of got into, and um, that was like back in college. And so it just kind of, um, you know, it, it feels more natural to me uh, to use that language uh, more than others, um, especially during uh, my time here at Pivotal. Um, I've also become very, very comfortable with SQL, and so that's also been super helpful, especially um, in, in data preparation and um, um, data cleansing, but also, uh, not only that, but also uh, for, for statistical and machine learning uh, modeling as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that there's, there's there's a ton of, of you, know, you know, objective value in, like, saying, oh, this language is better than the other, but then, uh, you know, for me, I think my... my you know, my, my opinion would be that it's it's really whatever you're most comfortable with. And at the same time, um, has enough, you know, kind of built-in libraries that you don't have to be coding everything from scratch um, and wasting your time that way. Yeah. I, I definitely feel like with the R and Python question, which was mentioned, it's, it's like starting a war. It's, it's a VI versus Emacs question or whatever your flavor of argument is that exists. And I, just from my perspective, I actually came in from the, the first language I learned in that space was, was Python. Before that, of course, I had exposure to things like C++ and Java and exactly what Wu was saying. It's all about being agile enough to be able to say, okay, you know, there's a library that I need and I'll be able to get my hands dirty and get in. So that's, that's definitely something that needs to be considered. Yeah, uh, this is Rajma. I'll add, I'll add uh, one one thing, which I guess, uh, unlike either Sarah or Wu, I was not a heavy user of either for um, until more in a more recent years. And I I basically came from the MATLAB world. If anyone out there, uh, I'm sure many of you know what that is. Um, and so uh, I have sort of an equal exposure to both in terms of R and Python, and I know there's advantages to both. Um, so. Uh, again, like Wu and Sarah said, and Wu said that uh, it, it really does boil down to personal preference in the end. So uh, I think they're they're equally sort of very much advanced in in many many ways, and I can say that as as having um, somewhat equal exposure to both. <laughs> well, thanks. Those were all very tactful responses. Uh, so, audience's uh, question: um, How much do you get involved in software development? At at Pivotal, besides doing uh, data science consulting with clients. Yeah, I can take that one. I um I can kick that off. It's uh it basically um I think boils down to how um in a lot of ways uh, both preference and how much how much consulting work is in the pipeline as well. So um uh so oftentimes you know we have a lot of consulting work in the pipeline and so we do things uh, more in that realm, but also when there's uh, when there's a lot of um, uh, wait time or downtime, then we get involved in helping um, with uh, with the toolkits like Madlib, if you're aware of what that is, um, and the database machine learning library, um, <clears throat> helping helping build that out or helping um, uh, test that out and things like that. So we definitely have uh, we definitely uh, are encouraged to uh, do that uh, in terms of software development at uh, pivotal uh, especially uh, also evaluating you know new tools and things like that is also part of our part and parcel of what we try to do building out demos uh, using the new tools or new libraries and uh, the, in the very fast evolving space of uh, data science and big data technology so we're definitely encouraged to do that Exactly how much time on a day to day or month by month basis is hard to is hard to predict because we do have the the variation in schedules coming from um, a pipeline of consulting work um, Wu and Sarah anything to add yeah I mean I guess just a, a quick quick add on there I agree with everything that Freshme has said um, you know we're actually part of an organization that pivotal uh, called pivotal labs. Um, you know, which has, you know, software developers, um, you know, application designers and, and product managers. And so, you know, um, more and more we're actually working uh, sort of cross-functionally with that broader team to build smart apps or data-driven apps for our customers. And so um, um, I think uh, uh, that's something unique that our team is doing um, uh, in terms of, you know, what's available out there. Um, but uh, it, it's going to be, 
uh, it's it's always exciting to work on those projects, and I think it's going to become even more central to to our team's focus um, in 2016 and, and moving forward. Terrific, thanks. Uh, so, next question from the audience, uh, and this one's also interesting uh, to me personally. You know, how is inferential statistics used, especially in big data analysis? Sure. Yeah, I can I can um, kick things off here. Um, so I think um, like inferential statistics is, is basically, um, you know, the process of, I guess, um, deducing things about like your, your population, let's say distribution or your population mean using a sample of data, right? Um, it's, it's basically mathematical generalization, right? That's what statistical inference is. And I think... Uh, with with big data, it gives you an even more accurate picture of that um, broader distribution that you're trying to um, estimate. And so the more data that you have, the more data points that you have, the more accurately you can approximate um, that distribution that you're that you're that you're aiming for. And so um, more than anything else, I think going from small data to big data, it gives you kind of just much more ammunition. Um, to make your inferences more uh, more pre more precise, and also it gives you the opportunities to test more hypotheses um, um, accurately um, because you have that many more data points to sort of um, you know back yourself up with. And so, um, and I'll say it again. I mean, I think with 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 big data, it's it's, it's it gets even more exciting because you can build uh, more intricate models. Um, you could you know you know study more. Um, uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, kind of more more precise effects, and also um, um, use this data if you have sort of the right platform to to be able to analyze it um, in ways that you wouldn't be able to do if you had a much much smaller data set. Uh, so I think yeah, at the end of the day, more data uh, makes things much more interesting for for data scientists. Woo, thanks. Uh, anybody else care to weigh in on that? Great, thanks. We'll move on to the next one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. Oh, no, I, I think we well covered it. Thanks. Okay, great. Here's a, a, a very interesting question, um, and it has to do with whether or not you think recent MOOC courses and certificates in data science, big data, and machine learning provide the real skills needed by data scientists. And I'd like to expand that a little bit. Everybody on our panel here is very highly educated, either a PhD holder or a master's degree. Um, is that necessary to become a data scientist today, uh, or will these MOOC courses and relatively uh, quick access to data science education uh, do at least for entry level? Um, I'll, I'll take that at least initially. Um, so absolutely, our group, our team in general is um, highly educated, although we often get the question, you know, is a PhD required, and it is, of course, not. Our team is not all PhDs, not even half. Um, however, we have now been slowly exposed as well to people who have gone through these online courses. And they certainly teach a lot of good fundamentals um, that allow, I think, the person on the other end who's receiving the education to learn if they find it exciting. I think, again, data science is a space that you go to. Um, it, it's not kind of a job that that you'll just go and execute every day. You really do need to find excitement and passion in it to, to do well at it. So these courses give you those opportunities. And I think for those on the team that actually have gone through these courses, many of them came in with a strong foundation, um, generally in something mathematical or computational that they were able to build upon once they show up to these courses. The courses give a good overview, and it's really about getting to the point where you're able to put that into practice and you're able to see in reality, you know, what does it mean? What are the actual effects um, kind of in the wild when you work on the data set of having, for example, an outlier, which is something these courses teach you a lot of the lingo and a lot of the things that come down to being rules of steps that you feel you have to go through. But it's not enough, I think, in data science to just go through the motion. It, it is about actually understanding why there might be a problem and then discovering that the data proves sort of that the things that you've been taught are reality. And so, so I think that's good motivation for getting started and then either in a job or in some more courses to go through next steps. But 
Um, Rashmi, you might have more to add to that as well. Yeah, um, just adding to what Sarah said, the MOOCs and the, the online courses definitely give a broad foundation and broad exposure, especially to the lingo, if you're not familiar with that, and to, to uh, basically hooks to find out what it is that you know and what you don't know, and so you can dig in further into those that might be a little bit um, less familiar to folks. To, to those taking the courses. Um, it does help if uh, if there are certain technical aspects that are not familiar to deep dive into some of those. Maybe uh, maybe if there is like some, some type of uh, mathematical um, procedure or calculus or what have you that that is not familiar to folks, then maybe that's something that you can deep dive into uh, once exposed, uh, once exposed to the broad uh, foundation in, the, in these MOOCs, it's well worth diving. I think into some of these more um, behind the scenes, what is going on, um, or and and the the other one I will add is uh, in a lot of ways practice makes perfect. So um, if uh, if you go through this, these processes within the frame of feedback, say if you're part of a community, if you can get, become part of a community. Uh, beyond the uh, going through the MOOCs, part of a community which will help you, uh, where you can um, where you can work on data sets, uh, work on new problems, different problems, look at the same data set different ways, and get the, gather the feedback from from a supportive community of data scientists or what have you, then that uh, really adds to the learning experience. And, and as, as Sarah said, I agree that there's a lot of curiosity and, and passion that. Um, people will realize with the MOOCs whether they like the the procedures or like the aspect of going through that because it's not it's it, you know you're never really the the data set isn't the same all the time the problems aren't the same so it requires fresh thinking um, um, all, almost regularly so um, that's definitely something that you get a flavor for in the MOOCs but I would say that try and expand beyond that and and uh, uh, be more um, innovative and, and being more innovative and in learning and getting exposure and practicing those skills will really help. Well, Rashmi, thanks. And, you know, we talked about kind of the long version, that is, getting an advanced degree, and the short version using MOOCs or uh, short-term uh, classes. But there's also an explosion in even bachelor-level programs today as well. And that leads us to our next audience question, and that is really, you know, what do you suggest uh, for folks seeking entry-level uh, positions in data science. Uh, where would you go to look for a job? Uh, what sort of credentials would you put forward? How would you prepare yourself? I can start that one off, and I, again, I'm sure everyone has a lot to add to that. Um, if we're talking about resume preparation, I would say that um, probably the number one thing um, to focus on is, first of all, your background in something computational. Um, some sort of a programming language, make sure that that's highlighted. Um, and then on the other end, for at least at Pivotal, what we focus on, um, again, either stats or machine learning as a, as a foundation, but really nothing too deep at an entry level. Um, we don't expect you to have a lot of experience. And I must say that even the concept of data science, which we didn't do up front, varies from company to company. You'll go to one company, it's really you know, data science can encompass BI or maybe it's, you know, A-B testing. Um, for us, it's very specific around predictive modeling. Um, and, and so somebody starting out, um, it, you know, if you're at an undergrad, make sure that you take those computer science courses. Make sure that you take, you know, at least stats, um, understanding that machine learning isn't offered at every single um, at every single university, um, and the online courses may be useful, but it's really that strong foundation. And then the ability to understand why these things matter. So not, not that you have to throw equations up on the board, but really to understand the underlying question that you're asking so that you might be able to apply it somewhere. Um, I, don't, I don't know if someone else has to add to that. Sure. Yeah, I can add a little bit. Go ahead, Wu. Oh, no, go for it, Rashmi. And so I can add to that in the sense that, um, uh, as, as Sarah said, uh, entry level requirements are, you know, not not the PhD style or anything like that, but good level of foundation and, and basic um, understanding of uh, why something is used where, even in even if it's just the simple models or the simple things. 
Um, and knowing something um, um, well is sort of better than knowing a lot of things very in a, in, in some in, in a little too shallow sense. If, if I'm being clear, is that um, knowing sort of um, the nuances of uh, even the, even the simplest algorithms or the simplest models or the simplest applications of those is actually uh, very useful to have very and very useful to see and. And that means that when people are exposed to more, more complicated things, as either as part of a job or as for the study, whichever it happens to be, then um, then they get to see the uh, different aspects of a problem or different aspects of a modeling methodology and where it could be applied and when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate to be applied. So uh, that's that. That's just my uh, two cents. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, Bye. Just, uh... Oh yeah, just, ahead, just one more from, from my end. I guess um, you know, if if you're out there just getting started in in, in data science, then I think one other question that um, could be good to ask is, do you want to work on a wide variety of problems and get exposure to that wide variety of problems, or do you really want to zero in and focus on a single use case and go really deep into it? Um, you know, like clickstream analysis or you know ad optimization or something like that, right? Um, and so. Uh, I think it's it's it goes down to personal preference, and so you know from the perspective of the job applicant, and I think um, you know that that's that's also some a uh, factor worth considering when you're um, applying for jobs uh, in this field. Yeah, I, I completely agree. You know, it probably as recently as five years ago, uh, data science was considered a very general pursuit, but these days uh, it's very easy to specialize and deep dive in in some particular portion of our. Uh, practice uh, and become a real expert in a fairly narrow but high value area. So, um, you know, relative to high value, uh, the audience would like to hear. Uh, so, what type of business cases are you helping to solve? Are they general or specific? And would you provide some examples? I can kick that off. Um, actually, they're, they um, do tend to be specific in the sense that even the same use case across different verticals or across different companies can have very nuanced and very specific issues associated with it. Um, one, one specific example I'll give that we quite often work with uh, these days is predictive maintenance, which is, you know, um, taking uh, data from equipment or machines and how they're functioning and, and to be able to say when, when or whether they might fail in the near future, which helps um, uh, both manufacturing companies, companies that use the equipment, uh, maintain them, repair them proactively, uh, proactively deal with it, any issues uh, ahead of time, and so on. Uh, but you can imagine, you know, in a, in a general, the general statement of the question is predictive maintenance, but the very specific in different industries will vary quite widely. Uh, whether it's oil and gas and drilling predictive maintenance, or utilities with uh, uh, predictive maintenance of their equipment or various uh, or any any other manufacturing um, uh, and uh, heavy equipment industry. So uh, the 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 equipment will be different. The sensors placed on it will be different. The rate at which data is coming in will be different. The, um, the way in which faults are captured and recorded will be different. So. Um, all of those specifics, even, even if you're, uh, as as, the, um, as we were just talking about, deep diving into specific uh, niche areas, you could spend a lot of time in predictive maintenance and still uh, have a variety of problems that, that you deal with. <clears throat> um, that said, there are some which, which have been very, um, uh, that have uh, uh, been done very frequently in, in other areas like churn modeling or customer churn prediction. Again, the data sources might vary, but the methodologies might be, might be a lot more understood and a lot more straightforward. So there's there's a whole bunch of uh, use cases like that. And in any case, any use case that we deal with, with predictive maintenance with its variety um, and novelty, because a lot of those things are still new, uh, the sensors with sensors being deployed and so on and so forth um, every day. So. Uh, with with all these things, we always learn something, um, even if you're doing the same thing like churn modeling, which has been done a lot before, um, or with newer newer uh, data science fields like the Internet of Things and, and predictive maintenance type things. Um, Wu, Sarah, anything to add? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Rashmi's, Rashmi's mentioned uh, a couple of use cases that our team 
um, frequently encounters with, with customers. So yeah, predictive maintenance, um, churn modeling. Um, I guess I can speak to another one. Uh, actually, this one was, was interesting because it was um, with a major manufacturing company that we um, had engaged with. And um, along with, um, you know, doing a lot of, you know, quality control type of um, predictive analytics on their manufacturing factory data, um, something very interesting that we were able to do was actually generate um, a lot of visualizations, like thousands and thousands of visualizations that would be piped to um, technical analysts. That, um, and then these are visualizations of particular graphs or um, 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 specific metrics that um, would inform them whether or not there is a quality control issue on their on their factory line. And um, to some people that might sound like, you know, pretty basic stuff, like it's just a bunch of graphs that you're producing. But even at that level, um, you know, although we were also building sort of, you know, these machine learning models in tandem with these graphs, um, if you're able to, you know, reduce the number of um, hours that a you know, an analyst or the number of images that an analyst needs to take a look at from like potentially like millions to just maybe a few hundred. Um, I think that's a huge, uh, a huge, you know, additional value that I think um, data science and, and um, analytics is able to provide uh, for, you know, that specific workflow, right? And so I, I think um, the ability to, to produce lots of visualizations and be able to um, sort those visualizations in a way that um, reduces the amount of human effort that's required to um, uh, to solve out a particular business problem. I think that's another area that we like to um, that we like to focus our team's attention on as well. Woo, thank you very much for that. Uh, and uh, Rashmi, thanks for those answers. And uh, so now our audience is getting more specific. And based on your uh, client delivery experience. Uh, do you have a favorite statistical or machine learning technique? Um, I, I definitely don't want to say that I have a favorite. Um, they're all context dependent. Um, I think from a customer perspective, because I think the question was around client delivery, um, we always have to consider that trade-off of interpretability um, versus accuracy. Um, and sometimes it's a bit of hand-holding that gets you to be able to say, well, you know, if we allow these more complex concepts to be introduced versus just a linear combination of terms. Um, I remember going to a financial services company where um, they were used to building risk models, and to them they would say, oh, I don't understand this concept. I'm used to multiplying things together. It's, it's really at that level sometimes that you struggle with a very specific feeling. Um, as far as kind of favorite um, machine learning techniques or uh, stats methods. I can tell you, though, that in, in the space, what comes up constantly as a question right now is deep learning. Everybody is talking about deep learning and wants to apply it and thinks that that's the next big thing. Um, and I would say also those online courses that were mentioned earlier teach them. Um, and, and so it's, you know, it's something to keep in mind. I would say that a lot of us and um, we will probably murder me for saying this later. <laughs> But, um, you know, there are some go-tos that everybody tries. Um, you know, if everybody goes after baseline all the time. I would say either, of course, is a classification or a regression, but you might go after, you know, a logistic regression and then throw it at a random forest or, or boosting because you want to be able to say, are there more complex maybe subpopulations that could be represented by, you know, interaction terms that could be captured in a more automatic method. Um, I know when I graduated from grad school, everybody was talking about SBMs, um, and I feel like, you know, with the with the deep learning now, neural nets is probably revived in that sense. But um, I guess I didn't answer, but <laughs> sort of the perspective of the world, maybe. Uh, right. Woody, do you have something to add? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I can I can go next. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd have to say, like, in terms of what we use most with our customer projects, it, yeah, I mean, it boils down to like a you know, typically a you know a regression or a classification problem uh, that we're that we're tackling. Sometimes we 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 also do a lot of unsupervised learning, uh, you know, like clustering uh, type of analyses for for our customers as well. Um, but I mean, I guess in terms of just what's most inherently interesting to me, just purely from an algorithmic perspective, um, 
I would, I would have to go with the, either the Bayesian methods or, or anything really that simulates its own distribution. So it could also be something like a, you know, a bootstrap type of um, um, approach. Um, but yeah, if we just focus on, on the Bayesian, um, um, the Bayesian class, I guess, of algorithms, uh, uh, it's, it's super interesting because I like the fact that, especially for hierarchical Bayesian models, um, it uses the structure of the data as data. Um, to inform the models. Um, and so what I mean by that, another way to say that is it uses metadata as data to build your models, right? It becomes, along with the data points, it also uses metadata to, um, to estimate, like, regression coefficients, right? So an example would be, like, you know, if you're building a model for the United States and you have um, data by U.S. state um, that you have collected, um, and let's say you want to, you know, build a separate set of coefficients or effects for each state. Um, there is this concept of, I guess, shrinkage where basically, um, yeah, they're all independent states, but then they're also part of this family of states called the United States. And so wouldn't it make sense to think that, you know, although California and Oregon are separate states, don't, wouldn't you think that they would share some inherent similarities? Um, and because of that, wouldn't you want to leverage that knowledge um, and use that as data points to to inform the final um, final estimates that you're um, putting together for for these states. And I think the Bayesian framework gives you a nice um, nice way to incorporate that sort of like metadata or structure of the data um, into the analysis. And, and I think that's just really really interesting, just from a pure um, pure I guess statistical or machine learning perspective. Yeah. Right. Well, Wu, thank you very much for that. Uh... That answer. And I think uh, actually Rashmi also had I sure. think, a couple of um, things to add there. Yeah. Oh, oh no, no. Uh, I think Wu and Sarah did uh, did cover it uh, really well. I think from a client delivery perspective, it really just depends on the the project that's coming in, and um, we oftentimes also use unsupervised learning techniques, and um, a, a lot of times there have been um, use of graphical approaches as well. Um, and uh, but in in many many cases, it simply boils down to uh, the, that the use case requires a lot of data preparation and cleansing and, and uh, nuances of that end, and and the modeling itself need, might not be might not need to be super sophisticated because the question is is one of um, um, one of getting the pipeline for data science uh, as much as uh, get, applying some very sophisticated machine learning technique. That said, there are situations, of course, where deep learning and uh, Bayesian models and things have been applied or uh, are of interest uh, in many situations. But at the same time, there are an equal equal number of situations where you may just be able to um, very satisfactorily apply something like elastic net um, for either classification or regression and um, and things like that. So as as well as uh, basic clustering techniques like uh, k-means clustering or hierarchical clustering and um, and get very satisfactory and very applicable, actionable results from those as well. Right. Right. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for those great answers. So here's a question that appears to come from uh, one of our social science brethren. And since all of you have uh, technical backgrounds, the question is, did you ever get involved in social science projects, and how did you bridge the gap between the two areas? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Actually, at Pivotal, we have a program called uh, Pivotal for Good, which uh, allows us, those of us who've been more senior members of the data science team, um, have been here for, I think, I think the 10 years, three years and up, um, to be able to take three months of our time and actually spend it with a nonprofit uh, doing data science work for them. And uh, we've, uh, so far, one of our colleagues has uh, executed one, one such project, uh, I believe, with uh, helping at-risk youth in a, a nonprofit called Crisis Text Line. And uh, that went over really, really well because they, they really appreciated the use of her data science time. Noel Seo is, is our colleague's name. And, um, she did a great job there, and um, um, all of us, I think, who are in this uh, uh, webinar now, we're all eligible to go do that, and we're all in line to be able to go um, donate our time to our to a relevant nonprofit and be able to spend uh, to to be able to take our technical skills and use it in a very 
uh, proactive and very um, um, very nice way for helping for helping other folks that might not be be able to afford data consulting services like this. Um, Wu Sarah, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, sure. I, I so, um, oh. Oh, sorry. yeah, just a, just a quick quick thing there. I mean, I think, um, yeah, definitely the pivotal for for good projects uh, have a lot of you know social science aspects um, as well. Um, especially a lot of the projects that we're considering, including the one that um, Rashmi mentioned, um, that Noel executed uh, uh, for for the for the text line. Um, but I think in in a lot of our projects, we're using a lot of tactics that I guess social scientists typically use in, in data analysis, you know, um, um, problems. You know, things like leveraging census data, um, government data, Bureau of Labor Statistics data into the analysis. You know, a lot of economists, sociologists are, are doing a lot of that or have been doing a lot of that over the years. Um, and so, um, so in some sense, there's a, you know, social science aspect in all of our projects that, that we're executing on. Um, but, uh, but, but, yeah, I mean, we have a couple of folks also in our team who have, um, uh, a background in social science, like um, a couple of folks with degrees in economics, for instance. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it becomes sort of a, a gray line, like data science, statistics, machine learning, social science, quantitative social science. Um, but um, I think I can definitely say that we are, um, for sure, um, in, in, you know, in, uh, applying a lot of the tactics that uh, social scientists typically um, um, apply in their, in their problems as well. Okay, well, thank you. Um, you know, in this uh, era when data science is uh, so exciting, the audience is asking, um, <laughs> are you fans? That is, uh, which data scientists or startups do you admire the most? Um, I, I, I guess I can kick this one off. Um, I don't want to necessarily call out any single data scientist, although I'm sure we all of our favorite person um, that we follow. There's certainly someone that I've followed from company to company to kind of see where she's gone, um, and then I, I tend to watch those companies, I have to say. Um, and there, there's sort of, I think, a lot of the obvious companies that people talk about where I think that, you know, the comment is like very commonly Uber. <laughs> you know, it is, a, it is a phone app. Of course, they have grown up in the world of big data. Um, and, and for them, it's easy, and, and of course, much respect to the work that they do. Um, it, it is fantastic work. But to me, I think what I admire most are companies that undergo transformations. They start off as big companies, and they're able to figure out how to maybe Uberize parts of their companies. So I would say what's, what's interesting um, for me particularly is to look at a company like, I would say, GE, and I'm sure, you know, Rushmi has a lot of experience with companies like this that have a lot of sensor data. But to see the way that they are so willing to, to start off being very scrappy with parts of their business and figure out how to introduce data. And then what I've seen across all of their different organizations, the way that they are taking the data that they have, putting it as the center and finding ways to grow new products out of it, finding ways to improve their current operations, finding ways to improve their current offerings. I, I find that amazing. Um, to, to see that sort of growth. Yeah, similar to what Sarah said, I think it's uh, it's really it's hard to pick out companies because we obviously work with many of them. And uh, um, it, uh, but but there are so many that are now really uh, starting to um, see the fruits and see and no, in a more concrete way envision the in the. The, um, the power of that, that that data could bring to them, what what they could do with it, and not just um, have it be hype. So I think the the fact that it's going from from uh, inception to uh, a productionization and operationalization, I think it's uh, is where is, are 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 the organizations and the people who drive that are are what we sort of admire more. Oh, well, thank you for those answers. You know, as we come up here on the top of the hour, uh, I'd like to offer you uh, one last question, and I think you'll, uh, you'll enjoy this one. That is, uh, in, in what ways do you think that data science will continue to transform industries? Sure, yeah, I can, I can start with that one. Um, 
uh, I think, um, you know, we briefly alluded to the fact that, um, you know, more and more here at Pivotal and specifically within the Pivotal Labs organization, we're seeing opportunities uh, to build data-driven apps or smart apps for, for our customers. And um, to quickly kind of define that one more time, literally, you know, uh, a particular, you know, end user facing app that's being developed by software developers and um, application designers and, uh, and product managers, but kind of um, um, in sort of the background is sort of this data science model that is giving, um, sort of acting as the brain of, of that app. Um, and so uh, you can think of uh, examples like, you know, particular recommendation engines um, that would have a, a UI component um, also built um, as a part of um, sort of the, the final product. Um, also early warning systems um, where you look for anonymous signals and that would sort of be the work of um, of sort of the, the data science models or the brains behind the app, um, and also tied together with the very well-defined, very well-designed interface that actually makes these analytics stick and, and useful for, for end users. Um, so I would say it's, it's really all about the, the smart apps and the data-driven apps, um, and, and I think there's a, a huge opportunity there um, for, um, for folks to um, uh, get excited about. Um, I, Wu, I, I love the perspective that you're giving kind of on, on how it all comes together. I think that's such a vision that we have here at Pivotal. Um, so certainly I think that definitely feeds to that future. Um, I think I'll, I'll take a slightly different angle on this question, which is something I think that it was introduced to me some time ago, actually, this concept of kind of not only what the future of data science is and how, how it's going to drive businesses, but I think also how it's going to drive us as a society. It's something that I think about a lot, actually, and probably isn't totally on topic of the question, but I think it's something that we as data scientists need to consider in everything that we're doing, kind of this bit around social responsibility, um, also responsibilities to our customers to allow them to understand that um, I think everything going forward needs to consider not only how do we succeed at our task at hand, but how do we succeed at actually doing what's right, um, at not just in the short term. So, of course, we can think about, I think, an easy example is how to get people to interact as much as possible with my application, to make it sticky, keep people there. And there's the one side of the coin, which is I succeed in the short term at getting someone interacting and touching my app constantly. But at what point does that backfire, potentially? At what point does it become, I'm spending too much time with this, I need to back away? And at what point is it also kind of our duty to make sure that people back away when needed and, and to not get them overly indulged in an application? Um, because at the end of the day, what we need to do is make people's lives easier um, to get them back to doing what they love and care about. Um, and, and so remembering that as well. So I think the future of data science also involves some amount of that social responsibility. Yeah, I'll round it off by saying I, I I agree with both Wu and Sarah. I think the the future of data science is going not just from individual algorithms, not just focusing on individual algorithms, methods, or use cases, um, but seeing them through from inception, right from inception, looking at um, what the end goal is and what the the application of it might be, and having people use it in a meaningful way. And um, again, as part of that, I think we'll see more and more of what um, what Sarah said, which is um, this notion of when is it, uh, when is it uh, too much and when is it that, that we may need to uh, maybe use the power of data science again to, you know, make sure we have the optimal interaction, not just a lot of, a lot of it all the time. Um, but yeah, I think in many situations, especially when, especially where, where in, in, uh, situations where um, where you're trying to prevent disasters or help people uh, that are in need, then I think um, um, a lot of this could have a lot of potential. Uh, the, the future of data science, so going from the end-to-end -end inception to application, I think is is where we uh, we will see a lot of potential and a lot of uh, uh, both potential and responsibility for us. Welcome, Sarah Wu uh, Rashmi. Thank you so much for your enthusiasm and your candor and your professionalism in addressing and sharing so many wonderful real-world experiences with our DSC members today. 
Uh, for those of you who've asked questions that weren't answered today, uh, we'll be sending all those unanswered questions to the Pivotal team so they can follow up with you uh, after today's webinar. Now I have just a, a few quick announcements. If you'd please mark your calendars for January 26th, that's our next DSC webinar, which will be Applying Graphic Design Principles to Create Killer Dashboards, and that will be sponsored by Tableau. Also, remember, today's taping will be available for on-demand viewing later today, and you can find it on the home page of datasciencecentral.com in the webinar tab located at the top of the page. So this brings uh, today's uh, webinar to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience for their attendance and thoughtful questions, and a special thanks again to Pivotal for their sponsorship uh, for this very special and interactive event. And our panelists today, Sarah Ernie, Wu Zheng, and Rashmi Raghu, for their participation in today's live, unscripted event and interactive as well. well my name is Bill Voorhees, and I'm very pleased to have been your moderator for today's event. I look forward to seeing you all again on January 26th, have a great day.